Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. <laughs> this is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for July 11th, 2023. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in sunny Houston, Texas. <laughs> Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life that you want to be living. We explore the habits and behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we've decided to keep. If you're new to our Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat, and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question yourself via audio or video. And we are also streaming live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start with our tittle recap from two weeks ago that the title was called only a matter of time the assignment was to practice setting reasonable time expectations by examining a project through the filter of the factors that complicate organizing work let's hear from our participants and zoom in zoom and on facebook who took a crack at project estimating at the project estimating title please let us know in the comments YouTube viewer Wanda Yonder shared her thoughts on why she did not do this tittle. Wanda <laughs> writes, if I had to work out the time to complete a cluttering or sorting project, I would never do it. Seeing sorting in terms of time spent on it is a big deflator for me. Best for some of us just to tackle a job incrementally to see it through and not have time hanging over us to increase stress. Decluttering and sorting can be enjoyable if time stress is removed, and enjoying it can make it go easier and faster, too. Right. You're exactly right, Wanda. Uh, we were talking about how to estimate a job's time in order to help you set more realistic expectations. But we understand why trying to estimate time could set up an impassable roadblock for some people. If an open-ended incremental approach is working for you, keep doing it. Uh, we always advocate for the slow and steady approach with an open-ended completion based on how long you can reasonably stay at it in one sitting. It sounds like you're doing that to good success. So our time conversation is to help people keep at it when it's going to take much longer than they hoped or imagined. And I think you've got the rhythm down for yourself. So keep at it until you've made it around the house. That is always our ultimate goal, whatever works for you and whatever makes it work for you. So uh, some people like to have a time frame in mind when they start working on the project, which is how we address this topic. Um, <clears throat> but if, the time frame just makes you more stressful, then forget it <laughs> and do what works for you. That is always our motto here at the Clutter Ferry. Whatever lets you um, get going on your project. M shared, I knew my project would take weeks. I've been working to make the living room passable and reported a couple weeks ago that the room had improved, <clears throat> improved from my being mortified if someone came in. Right. <laughs> this, this past week, I was up to the apologetic level and was able to let a messy friend in. Progress. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Yay. And I love it that you didn't wait till the very, very end. Like you, you, you let your friend who is also messy come into the house so you don't have to wait until it's completely complete before you got to have people over. So good for you. Uh, she says, progress. I still can't let my minimalist friends in, though. Well, whatever. <laughs> They're for later. But right now, I'm sure you have plenty of friends who can relate to the messiness level that you have and then can also be supportive of you about what you've been doing that, to make a change. Like if they'd ever seen it before or if they can come in and see that there's space now and you can show them, I changed this, I changed that, I changed that. Let them cheer for you and, and be enthusiastic about how much work you've done. That's awesome. I'm so glad you had somebody over. That's wonderful. That's a good um, sign. <clears throat> Marsh mentioned uh, that, oh, she answered the, answered the tittle via the web page. I, I saw that. Um, and she found that timers helped her set her time to do projects, though I did struggle. Right, but working um, against the timer, it helps you focus a lot of times. And um, I've heard that from people many times, just having the, 
the fake ticking clock in the background, just the fact that you're running against a timer uh, sometimes helps you stay focused when otherwise you might wander a little bit more. So good for you for using it as a technique, Marsh. That's great. You know, going back to M's comment, it seems like a lot of people judge themselves much more harshly than they judge everyone else. Yeah. And so, you know, you you have your friends, friends are coming over and you know their house is a shambles because their house is always a shambles. And yet you're still going, yeah, but yeah, but my place needs to look better than this. <laughs> and this right? is where we, this is where we remind you they're coming to see you, not your house. They're not 100%. coming to, they're not coming to judge you. They're coming to spend time with you. Well, they might be coming to judge you. Depends who they are, but. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the truth is my beady friends and I laugh about this a lot. Like we go over to each other's houses to have craft days, to sit together and work. And um, occasionally someone will go, yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, the house isn't clean or whatever. And we'll all be like, yeah, when you go to somebody's house, if you notice the dirt, then you have to clean it. So <laughs> if you um, come to somebody's house, you better be quiet or you are conscripted to fix it. Darn so, right. <laughs> we just declare that you no know, no comments are necessary. Uh, no judgment is required. We're here to hang out and have a good time with each other. And uh, if you notice the mess, you have to clean the mess. And that shuts down everybody. <laughs> no one wants to do that. <laughs> and it works for us. Great. Okay, here's here's a really good comment from from Jane in California. Mm. Jane says, during the past few days, I've been considering the tittle. My ultimate goal is less to deal with when I eventually move to a senior apartment. There's no ETA. That mm. said, I've been consistently working two hours a week on the garage. By the end of the year, I should have more than 100 hours into that. <gasps> I'm wondering how much time Gail thinks may be allotted to a garage where a car parks in half and the rest was full of stuff. Much has been decluttered during the first half of the year. I suspect uh, at two hours a week, it will take most of the rest of the year to get down to just what's still used. Right. And how great that you like the two hours a week is what you've dedicated and you're going to keep chipping away at it. And everything that you take out of there is one less thing that you have to move later. And it is one of the things when you move to a senior place, um, we all think of the garage as our storage of last resort <laughs> location and it's the first piece that gets lost when you move into um a, an apartment living um high-rise living uh, any kind of a, a store any kind of a apartment style senior style facility you're going to suddenly not have a garage and so everything that you've been keeping against possibility has to move into the apartment with you if you don't want to give it up and so that is an area that is very important to thin out to almost nothing or, you know, start pulling into the house the things that you actually want to keep because it, it's going to have to live with you in the house in the new place when you move. So good for you that you're going through it and going through it very thoroughly. I might add, if you're putting a hundred hours into it, by the time you get to the end of the year, you will have gone through it all very thoroughly and you can feel comfortable that you've, found everything that was super important you haven't left anything behind that you know might be important to the family and if some of it is that you're just storing things that you want to keep for the family or that somebody wants now's the time to relocate them to people that are still going to have garages <laughs> if they're uh, you know if they have a house and you're not going to have a house then it's perfectly reasonable if you, for you to say i've been holding this for you and um now it needs to move to your garage because I'm not going to have a garage next year. And so you have this, uh, you have the, you have a purpose to say, I can't keep it anymore. And therefore you need to figure out a way to keep it. And here it comes to you so that you can be the ownership of, I'm passing ownership of it to you now so that, you know, you guys can get used to that because I can't take it with me. And so <clears throat> I think that's, um that's a perfect room to thin out because whatever you keep is going to have to move in with you and you're going to be giving up storage space for that stuff. So yeah, six dog crates, she says, what, what is that there? Six dog crates and two dog exercise pins went to another dog rescuer. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's the kind of stuff that has to go out because you can't keep that kind of stuff anymore. 
when you move into that assisted living facility, when you move into that senior apartment, that over 55 apartment high rise, you're not going to be able to do that kind of rescue work in the same way. And so getting through it all and, and passing that stuff along, perfect thing to be doing right now. So good for you. And recognizing that it was full if half of a, a half of a two car garage was full of stuff, it's going to take a minute to get around it. You're going to have to put that kind of time into it. And if you, it, you know, if it turns out to not take you to the rest of the year, awesome. You, you can do a happy dance, but you're prepared to keep going until then just to make sure that you get through it all. And that's great. You've got a reasonable plan and you're working at it. And at the end of the year, you're going to be in a much better place to move than you were when you started this year. So good on you. Good job. Uh, Maureen, who's with us on Facebook, asked, Gail, how do you estimate a job time for a client? My husband estimated three years for our basement. He did? <laughs> three years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, now, and... The question, the follow-up question for him would have to be, now, how many minutes a month are you allocating for, for the three years? You know, for the I, three years, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, part of what's happening when I go to estimate a job is I'm looking at it, how I tackle the, the project, how I'm going to pull everything down and move it. And so usually I can look at it and see how dense it is. Um, and I can estimate how based large on, the space you know, is. yeah, from speed, yeah, from how long, how long you've been there, how many years it's been full, when was the, how often has it been moved, has it been sitting there for 10 years without being disturbed, you know, that kind of stuff. The longer it's been unmoved, the longer it's been sitting there untouched, the more likely it is that m most of that stuff is going to go away. So um, the more active room has more things in it that you're going to keep, a less active room has a lot more, it's more ripe for donations than um, a room that you're more active in. And so I, I can adjust based on that. And I'm also adjusting based on my work capacity, like what I can get done in three hours, hours versus what you can get done. And so he may be estimating three years because he knows you guys are slow. <laughs> but if you bring in some support and um, get, in, get somebody in there to work with you, it might go a little bit faster. Um, if part of the time you guys are doing it together, if you, you know, set the timer and stay focused for longer than he's anticipating in one setting, um, all those things might affect your ability to uh, make forward motion on that project. And if you can do it in less than three years, you know, I mean, I think that estimate for him reflects his level of overwhelm. <laughs> right. Like she, he's looking at the project <laughs> and going, oh my God. <laughs> Um, Maureen added that she hoped he was joking. Uh, Naomi reports, not exactly a clutter problem, but had occasion to offer a friend a gin and tonic yesterday. I approve this message. Uh, <laughs> realized there was about eight years accumulated dust on the liquor cabinet shelves. Swept, <laughs> but have not yet wiped off shelves and bottles. It's been a minute since you've offered anybody a cocktail. Is that what you're saying? Sounds like it. <laughs> Y'all are making me laugh today. <laughs> uh, Fee in Devon in the UK said, I thought it would take 20 minutes to sort my dump it in, dump it in basket in the kitchen. In the end, it took 10 minutes to sort, and I am taking the basket tomorrow to sell to my friend. There you go. Good job. Yay. Uh, you know, there is this process where you start decluttering and you start working on the project and you put in your you know weekly appointments or whatever with yourself and you get better and better at it over time it gets faster and quicker over time because you're getting practice at it you're you're it's like you've been going to class for a while and so then you get smoother at it as time goes by so what will take you an hour early on would take you 20 minutes later on so it's it'll you'll improve over time with how long it takes to do something. And, and that's just from repetition and practice. Um, in that vein, Sharon says, I'm new to this group. Last time I learned about the Pomodoro timer. 
-hmm. I found that when I think a task will take one 25 minute session, it normally takes two 25 minute sessions. <laughs> and honestly, so that's a that's a better ratio than I usually achieve. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you're being optimistic and thinking it's going to take 25 minutes and see, that's just that's just your inexperience with your own um, um sort of decluttering and sorting rhythm, right? Like it just takes a little bit longer than you think. And so just like we were talking about when you have somebody come and do renovations and they quote, you know, the builder always, the contractor always says, yeah, it's going to take three weeks. And then, you know, I always say multiply by three. <laughs> it's good. It's always, yeah. there's always delays. It's always, it only takes three weeks if all of the stars align and all the supplies are available and all of the labor is available and there's no disruptions of any kind which of course never happens. And so then it takes three weeks, it takes nine weeks instead of three. But if you know that you are being uh, optimistic, you can say, I think this will take 25 minutes and then go. And so now I need to double it. <laughs> just, just adjust your own estimate, you know, make an estimate and then double it for your own entertainment and see how close you come after that. And then you'll learn, you know, you'll, you're basically setting your own parameters. You're learning your own um, estimation uh, techniques. And so you uh, ultimately you will improve and be able to look at it and go, yeah, yeah, this is, it's going to take an hour and a half to do this instead of <clears throat> I'm, I can get it done in 25 minutes. Yeah. Um, I can name that tune in three notes. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't. <laughs> in, in reply to M's comment earlier, um, Wolf says, even minimalist friends can understand the struggle and amount of work and cheer for you. I encourage exactly. you. To be, I encourage you to be brave, and they may surprise you. And it's likely that those people are minimalist in response to living in a situation that wasn't, or they are striving to change their own behaviors because they themselves lived in a more cluttered space, and they prefer for whatever a myriad of reasons that a minimalist environment is more um, supportive to them. And so just because they're minimalist now doesn't mean that they don't understand the, the previous state. Like they didn't start out necessarily being minimalist. You don't know that for sure. So you should ask them about their journey and find out where were they coming from? What, what prompted them to get there? Why did they pick that? And you may find that they have a story that is a lot like yours. And they just found that being minimalist was more supportive to them as humans, as people in the planet um, than not. And so they're making that change. They may be able to relate more than you think is what I'm saying. M commented, I discovered that the work is easier if I think of the room as sculpture. I am carving away the excess to cre create the spaces and shapes I want. Ooh, that's a good visual. I like it. I also like it because it implies carving things away. Right? <laughs> that's, really, that's very good. That is very good. I um, just did a project. Um, uh, my friend Nori, who is a chiropractor, we've been working in her office. And so um, they renewed the lease. They painted. They were, And so they were as part of the renewal, they were going to paint all the walls, which means that she had to take every like basically take the whole office down in order and shut it down in order for them to come and paint all the walls again. And um, we use that process of putting it all back after the painting was done to reimagine the layout of the exam rooms, to change where the artwork was hanging, to, to take out objects that were excess and didn't need to be in there. And so we basically fluffed the space that had been sort of anchor she's been in the same office for almost 40 years 35 years something like that so we we changed things around and fluffed it up and we're as and we're more thoughtful about it and subtracted excess furniture excess art objects <laughs> excess uh, wall hangings we thinned all that stuff out and so the end result is a much lighter more airy space than when we started and i think it it's not minimalist by any stretch of the imagination. She's it's a doctor's office. There's too much going on in there, but, but it did make the, the space feel more comfortable to the clients. And they've, they have reflected that it feels more, you know, it feels more airy. It feels more spacious. It feels more welcoming. And that was a, a great result from carving away the excess. <laughs> we had to yep. put 
you know, all the exam equipment had to come back. All of the, her tools had to come back, but um, we were able to carve some excess the way that made the room feel better. Connie brings it back to the tittle that we're talking about. She said, I often go through two weeks worth of newspapers in one go. This time I timed it two hours and I didn't even read all the articles put to read later for when I have more time. And Jane replied to that comment, a time will, a time will tell Ben might be of value. This is where I put things that I'd like to read and may never get to doing. Right. I can't even, I can't even, I can't subscribe to a paper newspaper. I I've done it at times in my life and it, I, I get so overwhelmed so quickly, like day three, I'm like, why did I, why did I do this again? <laughs> because <laughs> the pile of paper grows so fast. Right. Yeah. It, it's definitely a, people that like to read, they, they hate missing out on anything that passes in front of them. That's, that's something that you can read, but there's only so much, so many hours in the day that you can read and you know, if you're retired, you have more time. If you're not retired, you have less time. If you have kids, you have even less time. And so uh, having aspirations to read five hours a day when you have a full-time job and two kids is a complete fantasy. Like that isn't going to happen. So it is something that you have to um, adjust for your actual lifestyle. And then I have a friend, you know, Marty, who reads She's retired English teacher. She spends a lot of her day reading and like she earned it. She worked like a dog and now she can read recreationally all day long and, and it makes her super happy. So we all have times in our life when we can get to reading. But if you don't have that kind of time in your life, keeping a bunch of stuff to be able to read it later really means you're going to read it when you retire. <laughs> And by then, those newspapers right. may not be really relevant. Te not terribly relevant. <laughs> right. Interest interesting from a historical perspective. <laughs> the, the, the time estimating thing that bites me in the butt every single time is um, email. When I'm trying to clean up email, I think, oh, yeah, one day's, one day's stuff. How long can that take me? And on a crazy day, I might get... 80 emails or something like that mm -hmm. and even even though surely half of them i just are junk open it and delete it open it and delete it right um, it still takes you know that's uh, it'll suddenly 45 minutes has gone by you know right and and why like email is a time suck for sure okay i think we should get on to our main topic before okay. we uh end up spending the whole the whole episode talking about the topic of time estimating again yeah it's funny because everybody um i get comments occasionally the main topic didn't start until 28 minutes in yeah yeah we do a homework yeah, we always sometimes. talk about the homework first <laughs> <laughs> we have other stuff to talk about too uh, all right sometimes we get stuck in our patterns and habits and can't imagine things being any different does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> the longer your space has remained unchanged, the more permanent the arrangement seems to be. But mm -hmm. the, the power to affect change is in your hands. Today, we're going to talk about shaking up your clutter status quo, that's in air quotes, and offer strategies for reimagining your space to make progress on decluttering and organizing. I found myself looking into a li living room cabinet last week. It was part of a built-in cabinet wall. And I was pulling open two cabinet doors to see what was inside. These cabinets were in the very center of the cabinet wall. So they were the most accessible cabinets of the whole set. Most of the others had some kind of obstruction in front of them. So that was really making them more difficult to open. Like there was a desk in front of one and a keyboard sitting right in front of one on the other side. When I opened these two cabinet doors, I revealed a vast collection of craft materials in a jumbled mess. I could tell that this had been set up as the kids' craft closet, low enough for the kids the access, easy to get things out of the way when the craft materials weren't in use. The last piece of information that you need about this is that the kids, air quotes, the kids are currently in their 20s. And that was why I found myself opening those cabinets that day, because it was time to get them organized again. I pulled out and sorted a variety of craft supplies, projects, and kits. And the client sent almost the entire collection out for donation. There were a few items harvested for other purposes and were relocated to other places, like 
we found a bottle of Elmer's glue. Well, everybody needs Elmer's glue. <laughs> and so the Elmer's glue went somewhere else. But basically the whole cabinet was empty and cleaned out in less than an hour. Most of my clients find it shocking that it can be done so quickly compared to how long it's been stuffed and cluttered. Of course, this was only one two shelf cabinet in a two story house is a small percentage of the whole job, but it's a good example of how a space can be reclaimed and repurposed years after it was designated for a specific purpose. And it got me thinking about how often we get stuck in how things are and can't reimagine them any differently. And this is true in life, of course, but also true in the context of your home. The longer a space has been that way, the more permanent it seems to be. But just like any remodeling show on television, if you put enough destruction, money, and work into it, you can completely change how a space looks and functions. So here are some tips on how to reimagine areas of your home so you can tackle, deconstruct, and rebuild them into their next look. Remember when you first bought the house? That's the first one. Try to imagine there was a day when you were house hunting and you toured the house before you bought it or rented it. On that day, it was completely empty and it was a blank canvas. You walked around and talked about where the couch would go and noticed how spacious that closet was. Without your belongings in an empty box, without your belongings, the house is an empty box with a lot of compartments. And it will be again after you move out someday. That blank canvas can be remembered, uncovered, and reimagined to its new use anytime. Remember the chaos of move-in day. You've been packing for weeks and moving things by hand before the move day. Then the movers came and it took forever for that day to be over. They ran things to the truck and ran them off the truck at the other end. They were trying to get done as fast as possible and you were dying for them to be gone. <laughs> when the movers left, it was chaos. Boxes stacked everywhere, no idea where the silverware was and a narrow path into some rooms. Maybe your mom was there trying to unpack a few boxes and things got thrown into a drawer in the kitchen or onto the floor in the closet. At that point in the move, you have about two working brain cells left and no one is making good decisions really. Things get unpacked and put away without much thought, just so you can get back to normal life quicker. That means there are systems that were set up on move-in day or move-in week that really make no sense. The house got set up in that chaos and it could really use a good rethink. I know the glasses are in that cabinet, but why? Do the glasses make sense there? Or is there a more functional place for them? You can look at where everything is in your house, and where everything in your house was placed right after the move and ask yourself, was this the best place for that collection of stuff? Does having these items here make sense now that we've lived in the house for a bit? We have a bit more experience of using the house. Would it make better sense if this set of items was moved to another area? If it's been weeks or years since you moved, you can always reevaluate where and how things were placed to see if it still works or needs a new plan. You always want to clear out a space first. You already have an idea of what you think is in a cabinet. The client told me it was craft supplies in my example, but you always find way more in there than you can possibly remember. That means there's lots of forbidden, forgotten things hiding in there. And some will be things that you've been looking for. Some will be things you don't remember buying or rather you don't remember why you bought them. You can't logically decide how to use a space without a thorough understanding of what you have to put away. You need to pull out the contents to see what you have and why, to pull out the donations and find the treasures that you've been looking for. The end result will be a smaller collection, and then you can decide if the place it was living makes sense or doesn't make sense anymore. Of course, the place you prefer to put the, redu re the reduced collection may not be cleared out yet. So if you, if you have in your mind that we have a smaller collection now and that really doesn't need to live in this cabinet, it needs to live somewhere else, <clears throat> but that somewhere else may not be cleared out. So if you have to temporarily put what you've kept back in the same place, just keep that collection in mind for when you finally get the destination place cleared out and can move it later. And then let's talk about um, looking at your major lifestyle changes. What about your life has evolved, changing from one focus and routine to a completely new version? Going back to my original story, the kids aren't kids anymore. So those systems that were put in place to serve them aren't needed anymore. 
Reclaiming the kid's craft cabinet and giving that cabinet a new purpose is a perfect example of updating the space to reflect the new focus of the home. Now only two adults, two adults live in the house, so the functional needs of the space have changed. Other changes might be that a parent moved in with you. That would drastically alter how the household functions, right? Or you retired after 40 years and you're at home doing your hobbies all day now. <clears throat> that would definitely change how the house needs to support you. Maybe you've stopped doing an old hobby or activity and started a, one, a new one. You used to camp out a lot, but you've aged out of that activity mostly. Now you're into ballroom dancing. <laughs> the house always reflects whatever you're into. So shifting the house to support what you're doing now is a good way to cycle through the clutter and update it to support the current version of your life. I have lots of retired friends who got to the end of their business career, their work career, and came home and had a closet full of suits or professional wear that they suddenly didn't need anymore. And they suddenly had a bunch of time on their hands and started doing things that they'd never been able to do before, like getting into cooking, or maybe they're grilling outside all the time, or they're doing their bead hobby several hours a day, or they're traveling all the time when they hadn't been able to travel before there's all kinds of changes that happen in your life that are really major pivots that change what you're doing and what you need to do it and when you're going to do it <laughs> that house can be reorganized to support whatever's going on with you right now and so let's look at let's talk about the spaces in your house that need to be revamped and i will tell you that the ones about kids the spaces that are affected, uh, that are originally purposed to support kids, like this is the kid's bedroom and the kid is now, you know, 40 <laughs> and lives out of the house. Uh, a lot of times those rooms are the hardest to dismantle because they feel so tied to the child, but they're the perfect place to recognize, okay, my, that childhood has passed. And my responsibility to raise those kids is complete and they are now out there on their own and they're still my kids, but, but my house doesn't need to be an homage to their childhood. I can reclaim these rooms and set them up for a new purpose. And a lot of parents struggle with that. Um, they fight that they resist that like changing the room is going to destroy the childhood. It's like, no, it's not. It's going to, um, make the house not feel like a time capsule anymore. I think parents find it, um, they like looking at the kid's room as still the kid's room or they're just used to it because it was there for 25 years and they're used to it being the kid's room. But it does give it this sort of uh, sense of this is the house that time forgot. If the kids are grown up and have moved on to their own life they're, and, and, and their bedroom has is still frozen in time when they were last living there in high school. And so it's one of those, it's one of the major changes that happens to most households is that kids are raised there and then they are launched and, and we forget to go back and reclaim those spaces for the, the adults that remain in the house. You know, the parents are still going to be there. They can still use that space. And, you know, maybe it needs to be a hobby room or a guest room instead of a kid's leftover bedroom. Does anybody have any comments about that? Can anybody relate to these situations? Uh, before I get to comments about what you've said, I wanted to share that, um, Deborah, thank Deborah for sharing that the time will tell, Ben, is a concept from the minimal mom. Oh, okay. That I'll is have to a, go look that one up. The time will tell, Ben. It's it's a, a minimal mom is a blog. I'm not sure whether right. she, d d does she have any books or just the blog? I have not read the blog. There's so much stuff out there. I can't read it all. I'm trying. Know, right. M says there is nothing like moving furniture to make one access what is in the room. Oh, assess. <laughs> Sorry, assess. She corrected herself to assess what is in the room. Connie says, I remember so well saying to DH, that kitchen is huge. We'll never fill it. <laughs> And uh -huh. guess what? <laughs> right. We have things over the cabinets now. I uh, guessing that it's full, right? It always looks so spacious when it's empty. And it's so funny to me because I can walk into an empty kitchen and go, oh, you're not going to fit in here. This is not enough space. And people always look at me like, oh my God. I'm, 
right? My how friends, can this be? How can this be? <laughs> my original clients, uh, my client zero, Michael and Lorinda, they bought a, a townhouse in their most recent move. And they both like to cook. They they do that a lot at home. They're both retired now and, and they do a lot of making their own meals. And it is a townhouse kitchen. It's not a full-size kitchen. And I walked in and I was like, oh my God, y'all are going to fit in this kitchen. There's no way. And they were so like disappointed to, and it was like, yeah, yeah, this is not enough kitchen space for y'all. I'm just saying. And, you know, I, I will just claim that I was correct. And they don't fit in the kitchen. And we have kitchen stuff in other parts of the house because it doesn't fit. And, you know, and they do their best to function in the kitchen that is too small for them. But, I, you know, I can look at a space and go, no, that's not enough space for you. I can totally, uh, you know, yeah. It, and when it's empty, it looks so vast, right? But it doesn't take long when you put a couple of crock pots in a kitchen cabinet, the kitchen cabinet's full. <laughs> the crock pot takes up, those kitchen appliances take up room. And so those, uh, you know, 12 inch or, or 14 inch or 16 inch deep cabinets get full in a big hurry in a kitchen. Deborah says, my last move back into the same place after a renovation, I found I kept reaching for certain things in certain places where I hadn't planned for them to be. I had to shift things around due to things wanting to be in certain places. Right. There, there is an instinct for like I will I ask questions in the kitchen, for instance, like, do you lean to the left to get knives or do you do you would you rather have spaces to the left or to the right? Like there's just some personal preferences about which way you lean when you're cooking or when you're prepping. And if you don't consider those things for the person that does the most cooking in the household, then it can be set up in a way that is frustrating to the person that's using it. Yeah, or counterproductive. <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. And so it, Deborah experienced that by, okay, now I'm in here trying to do stuff and I keep reaching over here like it should be over here and it's not. And so to make it be supportive for her, shifting it so that it was where she expected it to be was perfectly, you know, like that's how she was making the kitchen work better for her. So awesome. Good job. Um, Brenda says, as a kid, we move constantly, army mm. brat. As an adult, I have stayed put for decades. Opposite problem, I had to get past. I had to get past not wanting to get rid of anything. The minimalists have been a great help to keep only what I need or and really appreciate. Well, I think that there's, for people that are in the Army, and I think this is a universal experience for anybody that is, the, the, uh, the need to move is not under their control. Like they get reassigned, they get moved around and it's like, okay, now you're moving. You've been reassigned to another place. You're going. And so there's a lot of motion for people that are in the army or in some kind of armed services um, that, that don't, that don't really, that the rest of us don't ever have to experience that level of, you know, we occasionally move for a job, but we don't constantly move for the job. And so I think people that live in that environment as kids do have that sort of like, okay, that was a lot of chaos and upheaval and a lot of me adjusting to change. And I would rather not do that now. <laughs> so I think that there's a little bit of PTSD for army kids who have to change schools all the time and change friends all the time and change households all the time. And, and they do it without any, there's hardly ever any warning. And it's not, it's not like you go, you know, that there's a plan, but you know, things turn on a dime and suddenly you're being packed out again. And so I think that experience is hard on kids and, you know, adults can sort of adjust a little bit better, but I think it's hard on kids. And, and as a result, I think that they, they want to have that permanent experience instead for a while as yeah. grownups in, in response to having lived that way. And so I'm not surprised that you've been struggling and I'm glad that the minimalist coaching is helping you uh, shift your experience about that a little bit. I just wanted to acknowledge, I think that that happens with army kids a lot. <laughs> I think that's their general experience. Yeah. Um, a couple of people uh, chimed in to say the minimal mom has a books and classes and also a YouTube channel. So mm. I wanted to share one here from Leela who says, Gail, I can relate. My daughter recently graduated college and got an apartment. 
she may be going out of state in a year and will need to bring all her apartment stuff back here for us to store. So for the moment, I've basically, basically shut the door to her bedroom with all her remaining stuff in it, and I pretend the room doesn't exist. <laughs> LOL. She has not had time yet to go through her childhood stuff and declutter. But I have slowly thinned her stuff out of the other parts of the house and moved them to her, whoops, it jumped away from me, moved them to her old bedroom. So I have been able to reimagine a few small closet shelves in other spaces. That's good. That's really good. And I would also suggest that um, the idea that she's going to move out of state, out of the area in a year, means that all the stuff has to come back to you. I think that's not necessarily the default solution. Um, I mean, I think that she probably thinks it is, but, but I think it's an opportunity to ask yourself, how much of the stuff that she has right now, does it really need to be stored for her to keep later or can it just be disposed of now and let her move to the new place and get you know new stuff on the other end and then when she leaves and comes home she can dispose of that stuff out there and like do you we really have to save against um you know when she comes home like what i'm imagining as a young person the stuff that she has in her house now is probably not the stuff that she wants to live with when she's 30 <laughs> It's going to change over time. And so what she's using right now uh, will lose its important importance and value. And so bringing it home and storing it with you. Mm, yeah, I've seen that happen before. And like, you don't need to be the repository of old furniture or um, objects. It, like encourage her to offer them to her friends, disperse anything out that she doesn't think that she's going to want long term like at least at the very least vastly minimize the stuff that comes to your house and, and then set a time limit on it. Like, yeah, we can store it for a year, but after that, we're going to dispose of it. If you haven't come home yet, if you're not going to need it, like we're not the, we're not the physical storage unit of your objects. So um, yeah, change the narrative around that right up front. <laughs> That's and that, and that's that brutal brutal clutter fairy policy on adult <laughs> children's stuff <laughs> right? like you know they will think of you as a storage unit forever unless you draw some boundaries and and you can you know there's logic to you don't need to store her you know ikea furniture that's not worth very much and have it take up space and then you know move it again to another apartment and she won't won't like it and she'll get rid of it soon like it, it, there's just um there's no need to keep a bunch of stuff like let it go now and she can buy get fresh when she comes home if she needs to like it's just um you know i mean if she even if she's buying used on facebook in facebook marketplace even if she's going to a resale store and buying stuff inexpensively it's easier for for someone else to be using what she had currently instead of having it gather dust and take up a lot of space in your house and 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 then on the other end she's not going to end up using it all anyway and she's going to be like oh i don't want to take that mom it's like no no i didn't store it for five years so that you can tell me you don't want to take it now <laughs> so save yourself the trouble have that conversation now there you go <laughs> Ginger I love it. Said, the, the brutal clutter fairy <laughs> advice about adult children. <laughs> right. Ginger it's said, true. every year I go through all 57 drawers. I've switched some drawer contents. I've done the same routine with all 17 cabinets and three of the five closets. I keep an inventory. I'm always amazed at the stuff I find to declutter. Even the most organized people, if they take another look and shift shift the perspective a little a little more little have a little more time go by can find something else that just doesn't need to be there anymore right and you can also watch your excuse for keeping it collapse like in the moment where you're looking at it and going i might need that because fill in the blank like you make up a reason that seems logical for you to keep something. And then another year goes by and you're like, yeah, that was some hallucination I was having. Like that never happened or whatever. Like it's a way to uh, bust through some of your own myths about how you're going to use something. If a little bit more time goes by and you go back through it again, it's like, oh yeah, I thought I was going to 
make those, you know, gifts, or I was going to cook all that stuff or whatever. And, and, and no, that never really came to pass. And so um, you get better at, at listening to your own um, made up reasons to keep stuff and that, and recognizing that it's kind of hot air sometimes <laughs> and, and you can let's you learn to let stuff go earlier um here's a great comment from deborah and 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 maybe a a question will we want to ask our youtube audience to comment on she says i have read stories about children of hoarders but i am curious about the children of extreme minimalists do children of military families become minimalist or cluttered a BFF of mine is a third culture kid and prefers maximalism due to many moves in the diplomatic services as a child. Mm -hmm. Anyone here have that experience? I, I would love to hear uh, responses to that from our audi live audience and uh, and people watching this on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here's a really nice comment from Jane in, in California because um, we comment occasionally on other organizers uh work online and jane says for the past four years i've been following gail dawn the minimal mom and dana k white each brings different insights to my decluttering journey gail helps me understand the why behind what i've kept and moving forward with hard stuff dawn helps with challenges in getting things out like like gail's tittles and dana has helped with the permission to use the onion method letting go of trash relocating easy stuff and donating duh clutter they each have a role in the success of this this journey and i so much appreciate them oh that's great i'm we we're glad to be included in your um uh, collection of people that are supporting you that's awesome really glad thank you amanda says i wish my parents were more stern about storing my stuff because now I've inherited the house along with the built up deferred decisions oh, would have been mm. easier to deal with gradually. Right. And, and that's part of how you sell it now. Like, do you really want to find this stuff when you're 40 and I'm moving out of this house? Like, <laughs> no. And so you're right. Like it, it, your parents' house uh, is, is that free storage that lets you defer more decisions. Right. Yeah, I totally get it. Um, what can you do? Here's a great question that is actually a little bit of an intro to last week, but I'll I'll, I'll let you try and answer let you try to answer it before okay. I make the pitch for next week. Okay. Teresa says a sibling has moved in with me permanently with no notice. Oh. I feel the need to make room by get, getting rid of my things. Any ideas? Yes. Oh, that's uh, okay. So two people into one person's household that's that's you know just like a couple gets married and moves in to somebody's house you know you get a roommate and you have to make it's like suddenly instead of 100 percent of the house for you you basically need to give up 50 percent of the house for you and so um all of those spaces like they have a bedroom and you have a bedroom so that still stays yours but then all of those common areas you have to walk through and think how much of this is just me storing stuff here and how can I make space for um, my sibling to now have space in the house? And so if your goal is to remove 50% of the common areas to give them room to move in, blend in, add in their own life into your shared space, it's a good parameter to go into a public area and go, okay, now I have to get rid of half of this. What am I going to do? What are we going to get rid of? And to do that dovetailed along with conversations of this is what the sibling is bringing to the house. Do we want, is there furniture that we need to move in? Is there um, uh, like, do we have two sets of everything for the kitchen and we need to go through and pick the best of all of it and let half of it go um, in the blending of a household, you have to bring your stuff and their stuff and pool it together and see what of all that stuff is going to stay. And the answer is not a hundred percent of both. Clearly everybody's going to have to let go of something in order for it to fit into the house and not be a misery for both of you. So uh, find the public areas where you have shared, you know, here's the kitchen, here's the living room, here's the dining room, here's the den, uh, here's the hall closet. And, 
if she if that sibling needs to participate in some of those spaces as well, they have things to bring into the house, then you guys have to talk about, OK, I have this and you have that and we have duplicates here. And how can we thin this population and have it fit in this closet? Because this is the closet where that stuff's going to go and uh, doing those things sort of as a joint project is how you like they have to give up stuff. You have to give up stuff. And ultimately everybody has to give up part at least half to be able to fit into a house and not be, you know, not be drowning or super chaotic, right? You don't want to create a very tight space by having somebody move in. It's time to filter. And, you know, maybe they have, maybe you like their couch better than your couch. And so we're going to put the couch, this, bring the new couch in and get rid of the old couch, that kind of stuff. And so having that conversation about every area of the house what are you wanting to add? What do we need to bring here? Um, I like this better than that. I like that fork better than this. You know, I like this silverware better than that silverware, that kind of stuff. Um, every, both of you are adults that need to shed in order for this cohabitation to work. And so um, everybody participating in the process and everybody letting go of some to make space is how you guys are going to blend your households and everybody can function and everybody can feel at home and, and you know, you're going to remake your space to be y'all space instead of your space. And so it's going to become a shared uh, vision for the house. And that's what you're, uh, you're aiming for at this point. All right. On that note, let's talk about next week. Okay. <laughs> Children, roommates, housemates, spouses, parents, unruly house guests, and unexpected siblings can muddle or add complexity to our organizing challenges. Next mm -hmm. week, we're going to explore these complicating factors and suggest ways to improve communication, negotiation, and cooperation to decrease household conflict and clutter. Join us on Tuesday, July 18th, 2023 for that topic. How exciting. We're going to Let talk share, about it more. Let me share one more comment and then okay. I'll ask you for the, for the tittle. This okay. one is from Kathy, who says, my farm wife mom would not allow any indoor animals, i.e. kitties, saying, you can have as many cats as you want when you own your own house. <laughs> Fast forward, I eventually had seven cats. <laughs> They're all gone now, but I was very <laughs> gleeful while I had them, especially uh. when mom would come to visit and she would give me the look. LOL. <laughs> Like you said, and here they are, mom. Right. <laughs> well, and that's exactly, like, you know what? Just taking we all that have motherly our own advice. House, right. <laughs> we all have what we want in our house. And so, you know, there you go. I'm glad you had seven cats. That was wonderful. <laughs> Why don't you give us the weekly tittle? Okay. So this week's tittle is called Shake It Up. This week's assignment is to disrupt the status quo for a space in your home. Identify a space in the house that was set up to serve a function that's no longer needed, like a playroom for your long grown kids or a closet full of clothes that you stopped wearing when you retired. Pull all of the contents out of the space. Move anything that you want to keep, such as items that never belong there in the first place, to a more appropriate storage location. Sort the rest of the contents for gifting, donation, recycling, or disposal. And then take advantage of this opportunity to give the space a thorough cleaning while it's empty. When was the last time it was clean? It was completely empty so you could clean it out. It's been a minute, I'm going to say. And now comes the fun part. Imagine a new use for this space. Start by thinking about activities and purposes for which you don't currently have enough room. Don't forget to involve other family members in the household in this process. And hopefully you can reclaim a space in your house to have a new purpose and a new life. And we will look forward to hearing about from, uh, from you next week. If you're watching this on YouTube, we would love for you to join us live. To receive notifications about the upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by going to cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you. So please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere else that you find us. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairhouston.com. Yes, you can. And I saw something that somebody go by. We need a close-up of Gail's what? 
your brooch oh your oh oh isn't it isn't she fabulous this she is, is my fabulous. um this is my mermaid summer inspired uh, brooch metal and glass isn't she fabulous I got that from an artist uh, some time ago and I wear her in the summer because it's so it's so uh, summery feeling summery, to me yeah. right exactly all right, you guys, it was lovely to see you. Thank you for waiting for us while we had 4th of July off. We're back again and we'll be back next week. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.